both in she experiments with uh, recycling she's got a net zero home uh, in a net zero waste home in madurai uh, she's on the board of trustees for the world wildlife fund india and finally uh, this is at least the official bio medulla there might be other hidden things you haven't told us she's on the board of governors of the national institute of technology uh, in andhra pradesh so welcome medulla welcome to our webinar with uh, with our clients on a topic which i think is of great salience for all of us which is water thanks for thanks so much for having me very uh, kind of you now now the thing is uh, you know i have to confess you know you are in kodai canal which from uh, what you've shown us is is got a is got a lovely lake uh, it's raining half the time uh, we are in mumbai which it rains much of the rest of the year in mumbai uh, we are all blessed to live in uh, places where water seems to be in abundance last i knew no politician in my lifetime in india has raised water as a as a hot political issue uh, last i saw my the water in my bathroom is flowing fine so why write an issue uh, why write a book about water where exactly is this water scarcity uh, that we that we that you highlight in the book no i think that's a fantastic question uh, saurabh and i think it sets the tone for the book in our lives um, in the lives of the well off water is peripheral right. throughout the book you see that right um, if there is a flood you know we can sit in the higher ground high and dry and our generators will probably run um if uh, if you as you go down the socio economic ladder um you know in the middle water is a crisis of uncertainty will right. it come you know will i get wet how will i get out of this flood you know when will the roads clear so that i can go out uh you know for my job or send my kids to school or buy my provisions but as you go well below in the economic ladder you know in the econo- in the lives of the poor of the economically vulnerable their lives center around water and that's what we found out in our study right um when will it come will it come how much can i afford people i mean there's a sizable proportion in india living below 50 liters of water forget the 135 that's in the thing so 50 liters so two buckets a day to do everything wash cook flush um clean everything so i mean if that's not a crisis i'm not quite sure what it is and the other point is everybody is now latched on to the esg and the net zero debate right the corporates yeah. at least the big corporates get it but um what is less appreciated and that's how i in the introduction of uh, watershed i start off with a quote that says uh, from paul dickinson which says if water is a shark mm. then uh, sorry if climate is a shark then water is its teeth right? right and right. so um that's the everybody who talks in climate talks of carbon but the climate right. itself speaks through water right and how is the shark biting you can i mean in when i was researching my first book i came across this 2013 study mm-hmm. that says by 2050 the world will lose 1 trillion dollars a year because of coastal flooding right and the numbers for bombay and calcutta is around 160 to 190 billion dollars a year that number i spoke to the authors i mean their assumptions if anything were modest but i felt the number was outrageous so i left it out of the first book i put it in the second book because after amphan and some of the flooding we've seen in the last year that number doesn't look ridiculous anymore right. and a new study which uses better models has actually said you know what the risks are coming closer and closer it's no longer 2050 it's going to be 2030 and you know during 2030 some part of the year some of these cities is going to remain under water Right? right but then you've also got the schizophrenic reality which is beautifully embodied by chennai unfortunately mm-hmm. uh, which is also on the book which you know they are either they are sort of boomeranging boomeranging between this flooded state and a day zero state so yeah that's why we need to talk about water so so you mentioned uh, you know the 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 that water is the teeth of the climate change issue so just to sort of uh, 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 understand this further so one of the things uh, uh, after reading your book i realized that although we live in mumbai and mumbai as you explain in the book uh, amongst india's large cities mumbai is the one which seems to get the most amount of rain even in mumbai uh, outside my building we've dug a massive bore well to to hit hit the hit the subsoil water and um, typically in may uh, not in our building but the buildings adjacent we get water tankers coming in uh, our my colleague salil has come from bangalore a city which is 
very familiar with water tankers. Now, one of the things you mentioned in the book very interestingly is Mumbai used to have apparently have 3,000 tanks. So we live and close well, to Kauai, yeah. we, live, we live close to Pawai Lake, and apparently Mumbai had other tanks uh, 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 like Pawai Lake. I presume these are these are more than South Bombay and and in the the, the original city. What happened to these tanks? Uh, if uh, it makes sense that Mumbai had tanks, where did these tanks go, and who should we hold responsible for the fact that a, a natural reservoir for water has been deprived, has been taken away from us? See, again, great question, right? So the whole theme of the book is we got our water once. As Indians, we really understood this capricious creature, which is, you know, Meghaduta, our cloud messenger, which gave us this water. It was capricious, and it has always been capricious. You know, the uh, World Resources Institute did a study of 166 countries, and India's water is more seasonal than 162 of them. India is a land where one part gets 165 millimeters of rain throughout the year, and then another uh, part of the country gets five meters of rain in a matter of months, right? There's no one size fit all. And most of India's rainfall falls mm -hmm. within 100 hours, right? You can think sledgehammer instead of a gentle massage. And what that means is you needed those tanks because the tanks were a place where the water could collect, mm -hmm. help recharge groundwater and stretch out the water over time, right? So Bombay with its hilly terrain, it made mm. perfect sense, right? You just uh, dam and build up these tanks. But when the British came, they wanted centrally engineered works which right. could give a beautiful return on ca British capital, right? Not these particular return on capital. I don't have the exact number, but I do know some of the other water infrastructure, the return was well over 23%. So right. that was a great return. And the, the, the sort of spin on top of it was these, the, the air around the tanks was very unhealthy. They were hotbeds of cholera and malaria and everything right. else. So, uh, you know, uh, the, that, this thing of, you know, this native engineering is a little bit intraday. It doesn't really work. That, yeah. that ethos started with the British. But in the 60s and 70s, when people started flooding into Indian cities, these were wonderful pockets of land in the center of town, just waiting to be filled up and made into clear land. So again, from uh, Baikula was a tank in Mumbai. Uh, in Chennai, Tinagar is a, was a huge tank where the wow. Chennai Boat Club held their regatta. Wow. So, and now it's a shopping complex. So uh, I'll, I'll see Tinagar in a new light. Uh, it's fun to hear that, that Tinagar used to be a tank. So Mumbai, Delhi, I think your problems, you explained it nicely, that the, the British had a role to play in snuffing out the local water resources. And we are now we, where we are, where in cities like Mumbai, buildings adjacent, like mine have got massive bore wells. One of the points you make is, you've got several charts in the books. So I'll cite, cite one from page 66, where you show cities in India that over extract their groundwater. And in fact, you've given us a bunch of cities which over extract their groundwater twice over. And I'll, for the benefit of listeners, I'll, I'll read out some of these names and you'll be able to see the link. Gurugram, Jaipur, Jodhpur, Southeast Delhi, Southwest Delhi, Ludhiana. So there's also Jaisalmer. So a lot of Northern India's biggest cities seem to be the, the naturally water scarce, right? Places like Jaisalmer, Jodhpur, Jaipur, uh, even South Delhi are naturally water, water scarce and they're overdrawing the groundwater. What happens to them? They don't have tanks. Their groundwater, they're pumping out as if there's no tomorrow. What happens to these cities over the next 10, 20 years? Okay. So let's use a financial analogy, right? Since uh, most people will get it. So think of your uh, groundwater as your bank account. Right. So you keep making deposits in it, which is the rainwater which percolates inside. Um, but the thing is, all, once you concretize your ground, that's like your network going down when all you have is an online ba banking platform to make your deposits. So you can no longer make the deposits. You know, the rainwater is just going to run off. And you're making these withdrawals right. all the time through these bore wells. Right. So suppose you are, say, Jay Salmer, you get 165. So this means you're like this person who earns 2000 rupees a month. But you're now living this profile. You have, you know, some, your uh, ancestors have left you some wealth and you have some 10,000 rupees in your bank account. But if you're taking out 
four thousand, six thousand rupees every year, right? And that which means your bank account is going to get empty. The problem is you your screen of how much you have in your bank account is opaque. You can't see it. You think it's invisible, and therefore it's infinite. So that's the complication you're making. That because it's invisible, mm -hmm. you think it's infinite. Right. And you're making these withdrawals happily, you know. And uh, unfortunately, the poorer parts of the country, water-wise, are making are being more profligate about it. And the ground level situation, because water varies so, you know, it varies within 100 to 200 meters. There are pockets in these cities which are already in day zero. I mean, I got into this because we ran out of water at home, right? Nice. We dug 500 feet and we thought our water was infinite and we ran out one day. And you're really throwing away your insurance because some of the water that we are mining is thousands of years old and it's not that easily replaced. Right. So, so let's come to that. What happens day. next? Because uh, you know uh, you mentioned you know you, you gave us sort of financial analogy, and I'm sure uh, on uh, uh, a lot of our clients are uh, you know free market liberals. They'll be economist readers, and if you read the Economist, then you believe that all solutions have a answer in pricing and free markets. So what will happen next? How how will we deal with the scarcity of water? Will we like, I went to Qatar once and Qatar has lush green fields because they apparently, they desalinate the seawater and it's all good over there. So is that the way you're gonna go or, or, or are there uh, other ways that the scarcity of water can actually impact our lives, our businesses um, and, and say the sorts of investments we at Marcellus make? Okay, so let's just look at it two ways, right? So there is good and bad to everything. So the good news is there's enough of India. Like, so when I started doing startup investing, I really, water was what I wanted to invest in. But there are not that many startups in water because water doesn't have a meaningful price in India. And that's actually a break with most of India's history because, you know, Chanakya onwards talked about a water price that was universal and progressive. But today, India doesn't have a meaningful water price, so you don't have a lot of water in entrepreneurship as a consequence. Hmm. But this day zero situation where you know people are running out of underground water and don't have municipal water, that's slowly snaking its way across the country. And there's enough households there, which is making a lot of startups come up to service this need. So that's the good news. But now you ask me how are businesses coping up with it? Hmm. You know, the businesses fall in a spectrum. Some businesses get it, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're actually looking at their water risk proactively. But there's a lot of businesses which are not looking at it proactively at all. And one message that I have for the business leaders who may be listening to this is mm -hmm. visualize this scene. Mm -hmm. You're a collector in a district. Okay, mm -hmm. the women are sitting with their empty pots in front of your office saying, I've run out of water. Right. And then you've got farmers sort of protesting, saying their seedlings are uh, withered and dry and, um, you know, just they've lost their harvest. At that time, when the collector sees smoke rising out of the cooling tower of a coal plant mm -hmm. or bottles of water leaving a bottling plant, I can bet you that that plant will be shut down. Because it, if, you know, it's a no brainer politically. That, you know, when industry is pitted against farmer or households, they will be shut down. And a lot of industry has been cited without the water risk cap in place. So, right. you know, as the climate warms and you ask me, how is it going to impact us? Uh, I've outlined a whole set of risks in the book. But for now, I'll just say, look, as the water risk comes to bite, industry will start to reshape. Some industries will go out of business. They will have to relocate. They will have to look at their business model again. Because today, where does water find place in income statement or balance sheet? It doesn't. It, we've just grown up in this, you know, short honeymoon period of uh, thing. Even banks. I mean, I quoted a WWF India study, which says two thirds, I think, of banks don't use a formal model to evaluate their water risks. So mm -hmm. when all these plants are closing down and then becoming unprofitable, all the loans that were used to fund them are also becoming uh, NPAs. Right. So yeah, I think in the book, you also gave uh, some examples of hotels in, in South India, where 
the owner decides how many rooms to let out basis how much access to water he has that sounded quite heartbreaking to put up a hotel in a big city and then to ration the rooms basis water and then bu- builders are deciding you know when to pour their roof and whether to pour their roof you know uh, it's mm-hmm. like it's an existential question that a lot of businesses are going to be increasingly asking themselves now one point you made over the last 15 minutes right and a point which initially uh, uh, i was a little perplexed about you're saying water scarcity and flooding are two sides of the same coin can you just help us understand this because in our minds flooding we are able to link it to climate change water scarcity we sort of little perplex and how does if you can just help us join the dots water scarcity and climate change where does it come together okay so let's take india's water right and i talk about in if you were this explorer and you met this being and you would describe its characteristics let's meet india's water and look at its characteristics it's got four unshakable characteristics it's geographically variable right it is highly seasonal it's highly temporally skewed so most of the water in 100 hours okay and it varies tremendously across years because of factors like el nino uh, la nina we're going through la nina right now and then uh, the indian ocean dipole there's something called the madden julian oscillation there are all these factors that come and make it vary across the years and indians used to get it once upon a time so if like take chennai again right so you know when you have el nino playing out like you did in 2015 2016 2017 and then a milder one in 2018 2019 mm-hmm. you will have rainfall get depressed and you'll have drought at the same time when you get la nina coming in you will start getting more rainfall and you will get flooding right and what climate change does is if you take a photograph on your camera right and you just slide the contrast all the way to the to the right. right you see how your photograph becomes that's what climate change is doing to india's water so you're already varied and climate change is just exacerbating the contrast is basically so what you, volatility is going up the volatility yeah, the, the beta is going up right so and sorry so go on go on go on mithila so then what happens is your dry regions are becoming drier wet regions are becoming wetter but within a same region water is going to become more seasonal right so your summers are going to become drier and your monsoons are going to get wetter but within the monsoons your rain is going to fall on fewer days right so when it when it rains it really pours right and then you have break spells in between where it's becoming drier right so it's just like you take that photograph and you dial that contrast all the way to the end so that's it's just it's it's a schizophrenic reality and the one you know the monsoon is one of the most complex questions for climate change scientists to model but one thing that there's a general certainty around is the volatility is going to increase the variability within and between seasons is going to increase and the the wet regions are going to get wetter and dry regions are going to get drier and india by i mean almost every metric is one of the most vulnerable nations to climate change and we i mean it's pretty clear to us right that we've already crossed certain climate change thresholds yeah yeah so what you're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg because what you're seeing is not very easily reversible right so so and folks this is why in a way we are interested we as as in marcel as we as investors are interested as many of you know where our job is to give you guys a consistent return on your investments and a critical raw material for businesses right many of the firms that we invest in a critical raw material is water uh, and if as mridula is explaining water availability becomes more volatile you sort of have feast and famine feast and famine then obviously the business's ability to chug out consistent compounding for you and us becomes harder and that's why for us as as investors uh, this is actually a practical issue while we can couch it in esg even if esg uh, uh, was didn't really exist as a concept for for business people like us for investors as us this is a very uh, 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 practical issue so just to give you some data from ridula's book uh, she's given for various industries so, so the various industries she cited annual uh, uh, water demand and water use in 
in cubic meters per unit of production. So, so for obvious reason, thermal power uses a lot of water, 0 0.06 uh, 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 water uh, units of water per cubic meter. Uh, and, 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 and even industries like paper and pulp, even industries like engineering are actually quite water intensive. Uh, and and that point I hadn't quite I didn't really think of engineering as being a water intensive industry until I until I read the book and, and started joining the dots. So so given that this is a major business issue, what happens next? I mean the government will think about it from the farmer's perspective and as you mentioned the farmer's perspective takes precedence because the votes lie there. Uh, uh, how will we as how will we as as investors and business people deal with this water scarcity issue? So that's, again, a really important question, right? So businesses sell to consumers. Consumers are regular people. And what climate change, speaking through water, will the increasingly volatile water is going to do is it's going to reduce consumer surplus, right? So let's take farms, right? So if you take farms, most of India's farms are rain-fed, which yeah. means they're completely exposed to the elements. Yeah. And they don't have access to irrigation. So let's take this guy, like call him Shaker. And he's got this plot of land. And Shaker, uh, you know, until recently was doing pretty well as a cotton farmer. Yeah. And he used to, you know, every three years buy paint to whitewater his house before Diwali. And, you know, was planning to build um, like a cement outhouse or something. And then... Now with the water, you know, uh, all the rain comes in three days in July and then, um, you know, it doesn't rain and then comes in September. And he's planted BT cotton, which is sort of temperamental when it comes to its water requirement. Right. So his surplus starts going down, yeah. right? So he's no longer able to buy things like, uh, he, he's not able to afford, um, you know, uh, painting his house for the Bavli or... Just to be clear, surplus starts going down even before the government prices water for it. Even, even before... Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, it was because it's it, his yield starts plummeting, right? And right. so that's what they're saying. Most people are saying, you know, India, because of a combination of this water volatility and rising temperatures, agricultural yields without adaptation are expected mm -hmm. to go down substantially. Right. So when yields start going down substantially, the rural economy is going to have less to spend, mm. which means for businesses which have a big rural exposure, that's going to be a key demand side risk. Right, right? now uh, you start looking at the urban economy. Right, right? you're going to. Uh, so I've detailed a whole bunch of risks, like you know you've got availability risk. You have no water, so uh, thermal power plants. There is a study that I've quoted in the book which says thermal power plants which draw fresh water in drier regions have a 21% lower power, uh, you know, plant capacity utilization than uh, thermal power plants uh, located in medium to low stress locations. So, I mean, at a 21% utilization difference, you're not going to make any money. Right. Right. And so that's there. If you're flooded, so many of our uh, plants are located in flood prone zones, right? You can talk about immediate risk, but there's a bigger long-term risk, Saurabh. You know, mm -hmm. global supply chain, which is on everybody's lips right now, are resculpting, right? Uh, who is, when people just say, look, Chennai is always getting flooded. Will any global major want to locate his factory there? When you keep seeing Chennai in the news for all the wrong reasons, right? Mm -hmm. If you get dropped from supply chains, that's a lo much longer term trajectory changing kind of a risk that we're talking about. So, so, so just referencing Shekhar, I can't see any politician having the courage to charge Shekhar a price for water. I was going to suggest, uh, I was going to go down that line until you said, even without pricing Shekhar's water, his surplus is going to go down. So it'll be political suicide for any, any, any. Uh, but uh, Saurav, if I can interrupt, Shekhar is using rainwater. He can't be charged. We're talking about pricing the Bone wells and stuff where you're using non rain water irrigation essentially. Right. So, so uh, uh, has any country done it? Is that a practical idea that in a country where your electoral fortunes hinge around farmers, you start charging them for water? Uh, naturally, the emphasis will be go and charge industry for water, leave us farmers alone because we are the vote bank. 
well so many countries have done it right like israel does it and um, a lot of the things is people think uh, you know within india there are states that have done it right uh so in gujarat there is a combination of both flat pricing of their borewell uh, water as well as metered pricing so flat pricing means no matter how much water you use you play a flat price okay. metered pricing means you run your borewell longer you pay more you run as per you know you pay as per what you actually use so it's not as though even in india it's not happening today it's just not widespread enough for it to really tangibly move the needle right and then coming on to uh, uh, you know Uh, it's all very well for us to say what can the government do and and what can farmers do. What can we do practically to reduce our own uh, uh, own risks as as uh, as people living in this country, as householders, as individuals? Uh, you've made your house. Uh, I think you made your house self sufficient on water. What is the way forward for us folks living in small flats in Bombay? So I'll go back to Chanakya, right? And I'll go back to Chanakya and say. Um, first acknowledge water mm. right he is acknowledge water saying the prosperity of the king rests on his ability to provide water to his subjects and i i would say that you know in the past indians really understood their water they they took it into account and they managed it which is what made them one of the wealthiest countries in the world today we've gotten into a very dysfunctional relationship with our water wherein we don't see us having anything to do with our water we don't respect it we don't understand it and therefore we abuse it so step number 1 acknowledge it then what you do is completely a function of where you live in measure you know you can do a mental if you've run out of water and you're buying tanker water at you know 50 paisa per liter i assure you your ideas will come thick and fast and there is enough people are running out of water that you have all these gadgets with beautifully color coded dashboards etc and i've put those metering startups in there as well coming up to manage it i mean we are talking about it being political suicide in punjab uh, or any other place to charge for water right but i'm going to invest in a startup that works with punjabi farmers to help them manage their water use because by monitoring managing and reducing their water use they can get a sustainability tag which allows them to export at a premium right so there are p- things like that but if if you're more fortunate say if you're a company who's water secure and you want to help the best thing you can do is adopt your local tank right because if you have a tank in your neighborhood during times of flood there is a place for the water to flow into and during times of drought my institute has found out that you know if you have a functional tank it keeps up your groundwater levels by 200 feet on average and that's a big deal um the other thing you can do is recycle i mean sewage as i've called it in the book is literally your brahmastra in your back pocket it will account it will take care of all the volatility of water you know and give you water throughout the year it's not seasonal it's reassuringly perennial <laughs> and uh, you know the there's a hotel in powai uh which recycles its sewage and you know the the toilet water is slightly discolored and there's a small unobtrusive notice saying look it's recycled it's perfectly clean and this is to be expected and there's no smell or anything so there's no yuck factor and they've just made themselves more resilient you know you talked of tankers coming in your neighborhood well this hotel is one hotel that is keeping its bottom line up yeah. and keeping its sustainability chops up which is you know it's not an either or before i hand over to saril cuz there's lots of questions from the audience the person in this book that inspired me the most is the gentleman in viman nagar colonel sangvi so colonel sangvi in viman nagar uh, this is a, a folks uh, inspirational story ex indian army uh, person who's made it his mission in life to help say buildings like ours colonel dalvi colonel dalvi colonel dalvi he's made it his mission in life to help buildings like ours figure out low cost solutions to recycle uh, to do in rain water harvesting basically right and once i read it it sounded easy enough uh, next job is to convince my the management committee of my building but that's a fight for a different day sarel over to you for the audience's questions no no the the thing is he's talked about how he convinced his uh, apartment complex because he was the chairman and the payback is you know the thing about water is the payback is often in terms of months especially when you talk of rainwater harvesting and sewage treatment right so that's 
So I think so one of our investee companies is in Bhiman Nagar. So I know that I need to go and see the good colonel next time I'm in Bhiman Nagar. That is over to you. Right, right. So so a lot of interesting questions. Uh, uh, I think the first one we'll take is from M Balachandran. Uh, so he asked, you know, if India is such a uh, uh, in, we, we receive plentiful of rainfall. Uh, so if this is captured fully, right, and say uh, uh, stored or used properly then is that enough to meet our full requirements of water or will we still keep depending on groundwater extraction and so on? Okay, great question. Um, so the first thing to keep in mind is India's water is highly variable, right? So average is the worst thing you can do because in the Northeast, you've got five meters of water falling in months. And in Jaisalmer, you've got 165 millimeters of water in a year. Right. So if you harvest all the rain in the Northeast, it's not going to help Jaisalmer. If you harvest water in Pune, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to help uh, Mumbai. So water is so variable that, you know, you can, and unfortunately, you know, given the, the historical way India has developed, a lot of the water demand comes from the drier West and the South, especially municipal demand. So rainwater harvesting in rain secure regions may not necessarily help. However, one thing we've never talked about is the role of forests. Forests are the greatest evening agent that nature has given us. So they are the adaptation in rain rich regions to take that intense rainfall, store it and release it slowly over time as dry stream flow. Right. So Mumbai, for instance, depends on a lot of the forests which are upstream, which then feed the Vaitarna and all the other rivers. So, yes, to the, your question, yes, rainwater harvesting, but not in the way of, you know, you're building rainwater harvesting, but protect forests, protect upstream forests. And if you do that, you will get the natural rainwater harvesting that you need to protect your water demand. All right. Great. Uh, so, Amrithala, you know, a related question to this is that if we have surplus in one part of the country and say deficits or less rainfall in another. So question comes from Sundaram Ramakrishnan is that, is this whole river linking something which can work? Is it feasible? Can it lead to a solution? Uh, any thoughts around this? So I've put the answer in the book and I'm on, uh, you know, let me say this. When you link up two regions, my experience and some regions in India have already been linked. So why don't we just take a look at that and see how that works before we, uh, you know, we let's see what lessons we can learn from that. Upstream regions will always give during times of plenty. So when Chennai was flooded in November and December, upstream regions are opening up their dams and saying, please take the water. And Chennai was saying, no, no, we're already flooded. We don't want your water. So, during times of, again, this is the seasonality of India's water coming to bite, right? And if you put average and put an Excel spreadsheet and average everything out, it looks like it all balances. But during times of plenty, everybody will give. During summer when Chennai is, you know, being tweeted about uh, or Insta posts coming from global celebrities saying we're running dry, nobody will give water because they're also going through a dry season at that time. So that is one of the problems with river interlinking because you know upstream regions may not want to give when the downstream regions need it the second thing is we do live in a democracy we're not china who can just say okay tomorrow we shall link and we shall do everything there are going to be protests you know you've seen how long it takes for these links to leave paper and go into uh, actual functioning and the system works best when all the links are matched and even the first link hasn't really moved off paper and started working. There are quicker and you know the climate is changing so rapidly and the water is becoming so volatile. There are quicker, cheaper, politically more feasible solutions that may give you the same water bang for your buck. Okay and I'm for purely prag these are purely pragmatic replies. Sure, sure. No, no, that, that's, I think, gives a good perspective. Uh, uh, the next question is on, uh, this is again interesting, you know, the, uh, the government is pushing this null sejal scheme, right, where uh, every household is going to get, get tap water, right, piped uh, connections. 
will this you know, ex uh, make the problem even worse, right? Because you have uh, water uh, on the turn of a tap, right? Uh, and just like an urban household, you kind of end up using it uh, more than what you need. Is this a thing which can really create more problems than uh, what we have right now? Look, I mean, let me put it this way. I think the, the scheme promises 50 liters per household, if I'm not mistaken. That's not profligate. But again, you know, you're going to have seasonality come to bite and the geographically geographic variability come to bite. So in some places, the scheme will go fine. And, you know, the women, there's a section on the toll that water collection takes on the women of India. So definitely that's going to help, right? Uh, but the problem is, again, during the summer, when you need the water the most, is there enough water in the sources to supply water to all these households? So I'm not sure the answer to that question is yes in all the regions, but pertinently to your point, will it lead a culture of profligacy? I think it's a good idea to bring in metering and education at the point when people starting experiencing water at their doorsteps to bring in that culture, right? Because earlier when you had to draw water from the well or anything, your the labor taken to get that water, put its own stamp of value on that water. If you're now going to change the paradigm and say, I'm going to get water at a tap, good to get education alongside. There is some of it planned in the scheme, but I think it's good if uh, different people can partner to make sure it reaches the mass. All right, great. Uh, then we have a question from Anirudh Dutta. So uh, I'll read it out. You know, uh, so he says, while industries and individuals should be doing their bit, right, still 80% of water consumption in, its, in India is used in farming. Uh, so should the focus of R&D now awareness uh, be focused disproportionately in the farming community, so without neglecting industries? Uh, if you don't do this, we don't really make any progress. We're not really concentrating on the large consumer. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, let me just put it this way. If there is a... a a coal plant in Tutukurin, all the research done on the farmers of, say, Andhra Pradesh is not going to change the reality of that coal plant in Tutukurin because water is so variable, right? So that coal plant in Tutukurin has to start managing its water. It can't say 80% of India's water is, you know, consumed by farmers. So I, my water, and this is a, this is a problem I face with a lot of my fellow industry leaders, right? Uh, you know, industry, we consume point not, 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 not 1% of India's water. Yeah, that's fine. But in the local area that you're there, you're probably the bulk consumer. So if you do something that is not quite okay with your water use, you are going to act as a lightning rod for protests, right? So uh, I think that thing of saying, should all the uh, management eggs, so to speak, be placed on farming, I would say no. I think everybody needs to manage their own water simply because the water is so variable, right? And demand is so variable. The second thing is in farming, because it's so politically fraught and because water is not charged, managing water is a difficult thing as I've gone through enormously in the book. So, and uh, that's why I say decentralized, you know, everybody manage their own water in their own home, their own neighborhood, their own city, their own district. I think uh, that's what my experience has led me to believe you'll get the most water bank for your book. Right. Uh, and in fact, a related question to something that you also mentioned in your answer is that, you know, how do we make this uh, a part of the political discourse? And what, what can we do to make sure that the politicians are talking about water uh, you know, in more general terms? Um. So, you know, when in the introduction, I call the politics of water the depressing chapter, right? Um, so we actually went around and asked people would they vote on water? And the answer was mostly no. So I would say the best way, what can we do to make water a political topic? Uh, say, you, I'll vote for you if you fix my, you know, if you manage, you help us all manage our water. It's not the, it's not the political leaders alone. It's, it's all of us. And that's why I think in decentralized in, in a decentralized <clears throat> way, it makes a lot of sense because when there are case studies I've taken of a small village, right in Maharashtra, where everybody is charged for water. And over time, people were persuaded. 
right uh, saying i every household is metered in that village everybody pays a progressive tariff and uh, the villagers even paid for the part of the capex of the water distribution system therefore that particular small village has 24 by 7 water and is financially secure so you can make it happen but you just need all these pieces to fall into place which can happen but it has to happen as i said in decentralized places um and yeah start with your neighborhood and take it forward from there talk to your counselor right right uh then we have a set of questions i i combine these uh, you know these questions are around trying to balance uh, the two aspects of of the climate crisis right one is the carbon or the emissions part of it and second is is water so there are questions around that you know, we're trying to address the carbon through let's say ethanol blending with petrol right which presumably will reduce uh, carbon emissions from vehicles uh, but ethanol will come from say sugarcane sugar cone itself is so water intensive uh you know from a policy perspective you know how do we uh, balance this uh, are there any solutions yeah so the the second book was written because i felt water needed to be a greater part of the climate narrative in india it's not today right so if you look at india's emissions and if you take india's fossil fuel emissions relatively speaking they're not that high right when you're talking like 6 to 7% when error bars are plus or minus 10% you're talking with a lot of uncertainty right and you've already said you've crossed time climate thresholds and water is coming to the shark is you are i mean you're you're this far away from the shark and the shark has got big teeth and it's biting already so when you look at something like sugarcane which is a water hungry crop um and saying i'm doing this to sort of preserve uh, you know get my emissions down i think india because it has such a mean relatively high carbon price is doing a great job in getting a handle on its emissions and bringing it down which is a very important thing to do by the way but we don't have a handle on our water yet and this book is sort of my attempt to sort of say okay you need to start looking at these trade offs if it was my suggestion between water and carbon i would choose especially in agriculture especially in the places where sugarcane is grown i would choose water but uh, somehow i think the political reality and the dynamics of procurement of sugarcane means i think ethanol and sugarcane will win at least in the short term until we run out of water which may not be too far away <laughs> so can i just sort of link that to a your question that Anandita Kutiyala has been so so she thanks you for elucidating the future risks of water scarcity, and then she's asking right from the perspective of financial market participants, uh, investors, banks, insurance firms, from the perspective of financial market participants, what metric do you think would be most beneficial uh, for investors to track to assess you know which assets will get stranded due to water scarcity? You mentioned thermal power plants. uh um, you know is there a metric that people like us can track to figure out you know is it paint companies is it is it textile companies who you know which industries are uh, and which companies are most likely to get tracked is there something we should be asking companies when we meet them about what their usage which will give us a sense of their vulnerability so saurabh great question i wish i had a good answer so you know globally i think uh, investors are pushing and i've given examples in the book where uh big investors have worked with large companies to both disclose their water risks not just within their company but across uh their supply chain and getting them to both manage it change it or risk being uninvestable right mm-hmm. um but i've given an example in the book where the carbon disclosure project asked 100 blue chip companies in india to disclose their water water risks right and how they were doing on it i think three quarters didn't get back um mm-hmm. so but to a- answer anandita's question what is the one thing i would if there is actual disclosure if water finds a presence in the income and balance sheet right let's just say we are doing a course on becoming water resilient we are now in kindergarten okay we are so far from being res- resilient that we are in kindergarten 
so in kindergarten the metric i would really look at is are they even disclosing water risks in their annual report and does water find a place in their income and balance sheet why don't we start with that right. and then we can aspirationally move onwards and and just for for folks for just to illustrate the point the importance of this i'll give an example of a stock which is not in our portfolio and then i'll give you an example of a stock which is in our portfolio and which which sort of worries us so so there's a prominent chemical company it's a prominent chemical stock it's doing ever so well high return on capital employed it's not in our portfolio for better or for worse now that chemical company pollutes the river uh, in the village in gujarat that salil hails from right so salil has lived there he's seen that river get polluted he's seen the the water turn brown and and become uh, basically the effluent from that the effluent from that listed chemical company is pumped straight into the river now were that chemical company told to uh, pay damages or were that chemical company deprived of its use of water uh i suspect at least a fifth perhaps a third of the listed entities profits would be wiped out now at some stage it will happen uh, neither salil nor nidhla nor i will know exactly when it will happen it will happen because the people in that village in gujarat will turn around and say uh you know this is just uh, this is just crazy you have destroyed our you destroyed our, our our lives basically and that day that chemical company share prices will correct by 20 30 40% right so that's a risk that we are aware of now from nidula's book from 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 uh, 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 from the way she's analyzed the subject water shed uh, i realized there's a risk that we run with our textile company investment so as many of you know we have um, a textile company in our portfolio so in her book she's explained that for a typical cotton t-shirt if the if the textile company wants to treat the effluent such that you know they don't pump a uh, a uh, a uh, uh, pollute uh, polluting effluents into uh, into rivers and ponds it costs around 5 rupees per t-shirt madhula to treat the effluent uh, uh, this is up taking uh, page 181 around 5 rupees per t-shirt to treat the effluent so initially i was overjoyed to read that i thought this is uh, very refreshing let me call up the text <laughs> Bill explains that, and and this is obviously an industry she knows she knows very well because this is where her day job is. She says that the profit from a typical T-shirt is between two and three rupees fifty paisa. So it's not going to happen. This these Indian textile companies are not going to voluntarily uh, 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 clean up their act. uh because if they do that 5 rupees will wipe out their profitability and this is where uh investors like us will have to be proactive uh we can either sit there and wait for judgment day to be come and the profits of these companies to be wiped out or we can be proactive about this as investors and take the bull by the horns but, but there's something more to this right there's a wrinkle in this it's not just the investors see most of us will hmm. not quibble about paying 5 rupees more per t-shirt Hmm. to ensure that especially if you can you are guaranteed that your t-shirt has been kind to the environment hmm. the problem is uh, you know you've got this k shaped equilibrium coming up these good companies probably the ones that you're investing in sell to brands which are willing to give them some part of this gap between 2 rupees and 5 rupees so they make these decisions and become water compliant because you know as you said increasingly customers your local villagers are un, you know unlikely courts are unlikely to look the other way so these regulatory risks are going to increasingly come to bite and there are also reputational consequences the last thing you want is like this big brand to come up in the front page saying you polluted xyz river and so many children got sick that's the worst brand publicity you can get and that's a very real risk that's going to happen but the problem is at the bottom end the fashion streets of bombay where every rupee counts at that end you are not going to get uh, that 5 rupees extra per t-shirt right that fashion street shop guy is not going to pay you your 5 rupees extra per t-shirt mm. and at that end you are going to i mean there are horror stories of people putting pollutants down the borehole where you are just polluting the entire underground aquifer so Yes, investors can push, but what and customers will push. But what you're going to get is a K-shaped reality, where companies that you will invest in will comply, but hole-in-the-wall outfits will find it more difficult to comply. Right. So, so the, you're saying that it's not just a question of uh, uh, us kind of finding a few conscientious textile companies and them doing the right thing. There's the question of 
uh, Indian competition, Bangladeshi competition, Vietnamese competition to contend with. And if they're happy to uh, pollute their, their environment, then we are we risk being priced out of the global markets for these products. Which is exactly what the Kanpur tannery uh, owners, the smaller tannery owners said. You know, you said, look, we are shutting us down. Sure, we, you know, you're helping solve the pollution, but all our orders are moving to uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, where yeah. they're quite happy to let the chromium uh, pollution, you know, do whatever. Right. So uh, it's a, it's not an easy question, right? But I think it begins with customers also saying, look, I'd like to be somewhat responsible for what I wear or what I use. Right. Salil, your thoughts on this, on, on you know, what do we do about this aspect where it's all very well, we go and question the Indian company, but the Indian company will put their hands up and say, I'm in a global market, what do I do? See, I, one thing is, uh, and I think the government, in a case to some extent they're trying, is they're trying to make these effluent treatment plants as part of, say, an industrial complex. So, so it is not on an individual small business owner to treat the effluent on his or her own. Uh, what this also does is that you can have large scale plants, which where the cost Family. actually comes down yeah. effectively. Uh, and, and interestingly, when Bidula mentioned the Kanpur tanneries, I think one part of the Ganga cleanup is also this, that you have effluent treatment plants for a say municipality or, uh, or let's say an MIDC in Maharashtra, yeah. you know, GIDC in Gujarat and so on. So that is one, probably a workable solution where you can try and bring down the costs as much as possible. And you I think see? second, Sorry. The common effluent treatment plants, there's so many slips between the cup and the lip. Half right. of them don't pump it to the common effluent treatment. I mean, there's, there's a whole range of issues that have gone in. Right. Uh, so the ultimate, see, I think one reality everybody is going to change is sooner or later, everybody is going to say no more pollution. Right. I think that's just a consequence of India developing and the climate and everybody is just becoming more environmentally sensitive. How, and I think what that means for businesses and investors is that certain businesses are just going to go out of business if they don't change, right? And I think that level of business model introspection and investor introspection is required because, you know, a lot of these CETPs and, you know, a lot of the sort of massaging things, unfortunately, may not work because of the pace of change that is happening both in consumer preferences, in investor preferences, and in the way courts are behaving. Right. So, so I think uh, Anandita has raised a, a super point about how do we assess the vulnerability of our investee companies or how does any uh, uh, bank or insurance company do? And I think it's a subject that I think a lot of us will be applying our minds to. Let me just bring out one final dimension, which is the geopolitical dimension. So, so this is the riveting part of the book, Nizila, where you describe the Brahmaputra and how it arises in uh, in in China and then sort of curves into Arunachal Pradesh and, and flows through Assam uh, into into the into into Bangladesh. And uh, and unfortunately, I've never been to uh, uh, Northeast India, so I've never seen the the Brahmaputra in spade. So you describe some tremendous amounts of water. So at, at spade, apparently, folks, the Brahmaputra every second carries thirty swimming. 30 swimming pools full of water, right? And, and you discuss in the book that China is considering damming the Brahmaputra before it enters Arunachal, before it curves into Arunachal Pradesh. Um, you know, what, what exactly is the Chinese plan here? Why are they planning to dam the Brahmaputra? And what, what would be the consequences for us uh, uh, in, in a, uh, from a Northeast India perspective? So China is a dry country, right? And they want water. The second thing is, Again, because of this uh, need to bring down emissions, hydropower is considered a green source of power. So the dams that, uh, the electricity that dams generate um, uh, is considered green. So because so many countries have said, you know, so much of our power is going to come from renewable sources and we're going to achieve net zero, uh, China and India, they both want to build more and more dams because that's a good way to get uh, renewable uh, energy. But here's the problem. China's already built a dam on the Brahmaputra, right? But it's in the part of the Brahmaputra where there is not much flow, right? So it doesn't really, in, it hasn't really impacted India that much because, you know, it's like a small little dam it doesn't make that much of a difference. 
but the dam that they're planning, which is very close to the line of control, is like a monster dam, which is three times the size of the Three Gorges Dam. Oh. Like that's a monster of a dam, right? And um, yeah, the problem is um, it could become a uh, you know a hydro uh, disciplinary uh, you know uh, tool. I mean, just playing devil's advocate. I'm not saying this is what they're going to do, but during like a flood time, they'll open up the dam and they could accelerate the flood. During dry, dry season, they could hold back the water. It could become a potent hydro disciplinary tool. I mean, this is what India also did to Pakistan when we had a tap on the Indus system, which we have since then defanged, which I've also gone through the book. But here's the thing, right? You think you have a functional tap, but the Brahmaputra is just this monster of, you know, this, this, this enormous river. Mm-hmm. And it's that's, you know, the Himalayas came up because there are two land masses pushing against each other. And there's like a planetary level amount of tectonic energy there. There's a very real possibility of earthquake, right? So, and there was an earthquake in 1950, which reshaped the whole place. Okay. And the problem with the dam is that, you know, they're saying it's a run of a river dam, so it's not going to be a huge reservoir, et cetera. But if there is a traditional dam with a reservoir behind it, imagine what those thousands of liters and tons of water putting pressure on what is already a very highly Hmm. earthquake prone zone. Right. Uh, You know, it's that they they basically build a a dam as a potential hydro weapon and then it misfires and earthquake blows the whole thing up. Which is already happening. And then those are stories in the book. So, you know, you think you have this hydro weapon and it just, you know, you're trying to control what may not be. You know, you're trying to control a tornado. Right. So, so folks, many dimensions to this story. Uh, there's the practical dimension of our lives and our access to water. Um, and uh, Colonel Dalvi, by the way, Mithura, several people have requested his, uh, uh, at least his email address, if not his phone. No, I, will. I will. He'll be very happy. He's very good. He right. helped us with our uh, mill also. Right. So Colonel Dalvi and to help people like us do rainwater harvesting so that we, we have a reasonable future in our, in our, in our uh, water-stricken cities. Then there is the dimension of what do we do as investors about the companies we invest in because they're guzzling up huge amounts of water uh, and, and that water can't be taken for granted for the reasons we've discussed. And then comes the, the, the geopolitical dimension where uh, China is very astutely and very aggressively planning to use uh, water as a hydro weapon and you know it's, it's obviously an area of opacity but to understand the contours of that read watershed uh, it'll at least make you uh, awake and alive to the risks we face from our uh, uh, from the from our neighbors to the northeast uh, thank you very much Mithra. this was a lot of fun uh, thank you for writing the book and wishing you the best with uh, with, uh, with the with the book and hopefully uh, at least 10 percent of what you said will implement in our lives and give ourselves a better future you very much thanks to everybody else uh, thanks Saurabh. thanks so much and uh, just one point i noticed in the uh, sewage treatment and the question and answer they said you know there's pushback on sewage treatment quality we have a we have an anaerobic sewage treatment plant and it's very cheap to run because it uses very little electricity to run it's really the brahmastra in our back pocket it's made us water resilient and uh, it it Let's me, you know, just sleep and forget about my water risks for a little while. So just a shout out there. So you you mentioned the provider in the book? In the, the yes, I have. It's, it's all in there. So Ooh. the metering providers, the startups are there, the, the sewage treatment providers are there, the rainwater harvesting providers are there. It's all in Which there. Which is the problem? The solution is there uh, and all available for a few hundred rupees uh, from, from Hashet and from Mithila Ravnish. Thank you, Mithila. Thank thanks. You. Thanks, Saurabh. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Mithila. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.